Welcome to Rapid Movie Recaps. We swear it's not the same movie you've seen a million times. Don't forget to mash that subscribe button, give us a pity like, and turn on notifications so we can interrupt your day with our witty commentary. Oh, and if you're into that sort of thing, be sure to check out our merchandise below, because who doesn't want to wear our logo on their chest? So, picture this, Moscow, in the near future, Oleg and Aliona are on a date. Oleg's a soldier with a hopping two weeks off and Aliona is, well she's there. Things are going just swell, and they even end up spending the night together. How romantic. But wait, there's more. Over in Paris, because why not? A plane is about to land when all of a sudden, the lights go out and everyone on board gets a free nap. This napping epidemic spreads around the world, leaving only a tiny slice of Eastern Europe awake and confused. Oleg and Aliona, ever the observant couple, notice that Moscow's drones have stopped midair, so naturally, they sprint to the hotel lobby, because where else would you get answers? Everyone's gathered in the lobby, tuning into the news like it's 1950. The anchorman, with her perfect hair and somber expression, explains that this isn't the work of Mother Nature or even those pesky terrorists. Nope, they've just straight up lost contact with the rest of the world. No biggie. Hugh Mayor Dolmatov, who leads a team of soldiers on a super original recon mission to Kurov, a city that's just as dark and sleepy as the rest. Journalist Olga tags along, armed with a camera and an uncanny ability to find clues. The government's already sent in drones, but guess what? None of them made it back. Shocking, we know. When we last left our heroes, they were exploring the mysteriously dark and very dead city of Kirov. Armed with their trusty slime lights, because who wouldn't want slime in their flashlights? They discover everyone's dead, yep, even the fish. This place is like the merry condo of apocalyptic events, not a single trace of an attack. Next up on their bizarre sightseeing tour, apartment snooping, they find everything in its place as if the residents just vanished into thin air. Maybe they all just really hate cleaning. But hold on to your hats, folks, because things are about to get wild. One of the soldiers is attacked by a shadowy being who, in true villain fashion, steals the soldier's weapon and leaps out a window. Bullets? Please. This thing doesn't even flinch. Maybe it's just really into parkour. The wounded soldier, clearly not the most observant of the bunch, can't even describe his attacker. To be fair, it was dark, and he was a little busy getting his butt kicked. Flash forward a month, and over 100 million Russians are now considered dead. The government's asking everyone to stay calm, which always works right. Meanwhile, religious groups are gathering, convinced the end is near. Because what's a good apocalypse movie without a little doomsday cult action? Let's dive into the world of Yura, your typical reluctant hero. He gets a letter asking him to join the army, and even though he has an Alzheimer-stricken mother to care for, he's like, sure, why not? When he leaves, he can't help but notice that the world's gone all the walking dead in just a month. Impressive, right? Yura gets assigned to Oleg's team, which is just peachy. Dolmatov and Colonel Marina give them the rundown on the current situation. The dark cities are under quarantine, and there's a fun little area called the Circle of Life that still has power. Guess where it is? Moscow, parts of Belarus, Ukraine, and Finland. Who knew Eastern Europe was so exclusive? Now the team's got two tasks. Figure out why everyone's dropping dead from their own neurotoxins and scavenge resources from the quarantine zone. No big deal, right? Except most teams haven't made it back, even with their super cool tanks. As everyone's prepping, more volunteers arrive, including Aliona, who apparently decided to join the party. But before they can all catch up, an alarm goes off signaling an imminent attack. A horde of giant enemies is approaching, and the soldiers gather at the border, ready to defend their turf. Then, in true dramatic fashion, the power goes out. Dolmahov starts shooting flares, because who doesn't love a good light show? The soldiers open fire, but some of the strange beings breach the base and wreak havoc. Oleg, our fearless protagonist, promptly loses consciousness. Classic Oleg. Oleg was unconscious and probably dreaming about bears. Oh wait, he wakes up under a dead bear. What a lovely surprise. Yura helps him out, and they're both baffled by the bear apocalypse that's occurred. Naturally, Olga is there, filming everything for your viewing pleasure. Ole gets patched up in the infirmary by none other than Aliona, who's apparently a doctor now. A kiss from her makes everything better, because that's how medicine works. Meanwhile, Marina and Dolmatov discussed Sensors, a group of people who gained radio-like powers after the blackout. They're not superheroes, but they do have some serious data streaming into their brains. Too bad they can't figure out what it means. Enter Sasha, the strongest sensor, who's been having nightmares about a bald guy. He gets a visit from Zhenya, 
who claims to be sent by someone named id xenia dropped some knowledge bombs there's been a series of waves that have wreaked havoc on electronics biological organisms and now they're facing an impending attack from millions of mind-controlled people in the quarantine zone no pressure sasha's like nope and calls for security but surprise the soldiers can't see xenia and think sasha's just hallucinating as the soldiers gear up for their mission, Yura travels with Olga, who interviews him for her news report. Yura confesses he's weirdly okay with the whole apocalypse thing, it's given his life meaning, and hey, it beats being a taxi driver. When they arrive at the quarantine zone, they find destroyed tanks and a massive chasm slicing through the buildings, indicating that the third wave has already begun. Fun times ahead! Footage of the third wave's destruction has everyone in a panic, leading to riots and crime. The government claims they're working on it, but who believes them, right? The soldiers split into groups, and our favorite love triangle of Yura, Olga, and Oleg find themselves in different teams. Yura and Olga are busy flirting their way through the woods in Group 7, while Oleg's group investigates a small town. One soldier accidentally gets buried in metal bars, hoops, and needs a doctor ASAP. Enter Aliona, arriving just in time to save the day. She tells the injured soldier he's got to head back to Moscow if he wants to keep his leg. Meanwhile, Yura's group camps out in an apartment and notices something suspicious about a store. They set traps and wait for someone to spring them. Night falls and things get interesting. Yura asks Olga to stay behind and use flares for help if needed, but she's not one to follow orders. She trails the team and records everything. Inside the store, they find a wounded teenager who promptly kills a soldier before being shot down. Classic apocalyptic trust issues. Back at the hospital, Sasha gets some fresh air on the roof and comes face to face with Eid, the mysterious guy Xenia mentioned. Eid wants Sasha's help, and to prove he's got the inside scoop on the apocalypse, he reveals his not-so-human face. Marina confronts Eid with a bunch of soldiers, but Eid pulls a quick mental switcheroo, making the soldiers point their weapons at her instead. Classic alien trick. Eid swears he's on Marina's side, and oh, by the way, millions of his kind are coming to end humanity, NBD. Eid gets chatty in Marina's office, explaining how a moon-related mistake created the circle of life. He also drops a bombshell. Humans are actually bioweapons sent by aliens to wipe out Earth's native population. Yep. We're the perfect blend of destructive and colonizing. Thanks to some unplanned radiation, people like Sasha are getting their psychic abilities back. Fun times. An alien army is coming, but Eid's brother Rod is already here, stirring up trouble. Sasha's dreams hold the key to finding him. Meanwhile, all the teams are attacked by mind-controlled humans. The soldiers fight back, but they're massively outnumbered and running out of ammo. Yura and Olga's apartment hideout blows up, forcing them to call for help with a flare, but it seems like everyone's in trouble, and there aren't enough resources to save them all. Guess they'll just hang out on a rooftop and hope for the best. Marina's chat with Eid is rudely interrupted by news of the attack. Eid, ever the helpful immortal alien, wants to get moving. They fly to the base with Genya and Sasha, who draws Ra's location while in a trance, trusting an alien. Dolman is not so sure, but with Moscow under attack, what choice do they have? Meanwhile, Group 7 scales down a building, searching for other teams. Yura and Olga share a romantic, fear-induced smooch before descending. As they wander the streets, they kill some suspiciously normal-looking civilians. Olga's not happy, but Yura reminds her that appearances can be deceiving. Just then, a new wave of droned humans attacks them, and they escape to a garage, where they find a car for their getaway. Back at the base, Sasha's allowed to stay behind, but when Marina notices, she makes everyone stop. Right on cue, rockets blow up the base. Marina angrily confronts Eid, who admits he knew about the attack but insists it's all for the greater good. The next morning, Yura and Olga find Oleg and Aliona, who've also seen better days. Just in time, Dolmatov's team arrives and asks them to join the mission to kill Ra. Olga and Aliona have to tag along since, while their base just went up in flames. The team finally arrives in Kirov, and it's suspiciously quiet. Not for long, though. Streets are swarming with drone humans and bomb-dropping daredevils. The army powers through, crushing and shooting their way to the skyscraper. E takes Yura and some soldiers to the rooftop for a face-off with Ra, while everyone else holds the fort downstairs. Yura takes a tumble but manages to rejoin the fight. Distracted by an explosion, Ra loses focus and Eid and Yura team up to take him down. With Ra defeated, E decides it's time to kill the incoming aliens because, hey, humans were made to kill. But the team isn't too thrilled with Eid's god complex. Genya attacks E, only to end up killing Marina. Oleg tries his luck too, but Yura steps in to defend their alien ally. 
Yura and Oleg duke it out until Olga shoots Yura to make him stop. Jenya makes another attempt on Eid, but to no avail. Oleg takes a shot, but bullets don't bother Eid, who then uses his powers to make everyone look like Oleg's dad. Clever move, but Jenya, as a censor, can see through the illusion. He takes a leap of faith, tackling Eid to their mutual demise. And now, for the thrilling conclusion of aliens, explosions, and sarcastic heroes. A giant spaceship conveniently lands on some buildings. Oleg, armed with the device from Ra, joins Olga and Aliona, and they head into the spaceship, which is practically rolling out the red carpet for them. Inside, they find hundreds of aliens snoozing in pods. Oleg activates the device, and oxygen starts flowing. But time is ticking, and they don't have enough ammo to shoot their way through the aliens. Olga, ever the resourceful one, notices the oxygen pipes on the floor. They start smashing pipes left and right, effectively putting the invasion on ice. But wait, Aliona hesitates at the last pipe because, plot twist, it's filled with alien kids. Oleg can't bring himself to hurt the innocent little tykes, and the movie ends on this moral dilemma. To witness this epic showdown, purchase the movie at the link below. If you enjoyed this rapid movie recap, smash that like button and subscribe for more snarky summaries.